Coming down to the home stretch, we've got three speakers in this next session. Um, I'm going to introduce all three of them at one time so I don't take up more time in, bet in between. Alan Weber will be our first speaker. He is uh, Vice President of Mark IV Consulting and an Ag Economist who has used cover crops on his farm. Following him will be Kerry Clark, who is a Senior Research Specialist out at the MU Bradford Farm. And then following Kerry will be Tim Reinbott, um, Superintendent at MU Bradford Farm. Well, good afternoon to everybody. So I have the, uh, the opportunity of not only following Mr. Plummer, who I think um, always has great information, I also follow a great big lunch, and I get to talk about economics, which I'm sure everyone here is greatly excited about, <laughs> especially Pat. Well, there's a few of us here. So, so bad for me, lucky for you. Um, I only have about 15 minutes, and so the ability to go very far in depth is, uh, is going to be limited. So the way I'd like for you to kind of view the presentation today that I'm about to give is first of all as a way to introduce economic topics that I think that you know, we need to be able to aspire to to take all the good information from on-farm testing, from your research plots, and put that and package it in a way that, that we as farmers can, can better understand. And that's really the second thing from my perspective is that I'm going to give you today's talk from the perspective as a producer. So through my lens as a farmer, I still actively farm with my father, um, Pettis County, just south of I-70, 875-acre uh, diversified crop and livestock farm. So we, we do have experience with cover crops, um, albeit most of our experience has been with cereal rye and with clovers. So a couple of the cover crops that I'm going to talk about today, I do not have personal experience with, but they're the ones that I do want to integrate into our specific situation. So why are we, as my father and I, interested in cover crops? Um, I believe that Dr. Myers presented this information earlier. If I looked at the survey results from the uh, SARE survey last summer, I would have to say that I agree with what was said. I may rearrange a couple of things, but primarily these are the same reasons why we have been interested in the past and still are interested in production and use of, of cover crops. Some of the things though that, um, that make me a little bit nervous, we, we see great trends in terms of the interest level as well as adoption of cover crops. Some of that same information from the SARE survey last, last summer. But at the same point in time, what I'm always concerned about is making sure that uh, producers are going to continue to look at using and continue to integrate it for a number of years so that we can see some of those longer term benefits. And when we start thinking about commodity prices as they are starting to trend down, um, we're starting to look at forecasts of shrinking margins, um, I always get a little bit concerned because of the fact that you know, no matter what, as farmers we are interested in the long term and you'll probably hear the same um, messages a little bit later on from our farmer panel. So we get it, we know that the long term is crucial, but by the same to token, um, the short term and cash flow always weighs heavy on our mind. And so in, in many cases, you know, we're, we're kind of, we're always pushed to look at it from that perspective. What's the first thing you do whenever you start planning for the next year? You pull out an enterprise budget and you look at your annual anticipated revenues and your annual anticipated expenses. So from an economic perspective, one of the things that I like to try to do is to, to take a look at both the short-term annual impacts as well as then looking at methods and ways that we can take some of these longer-term yield factors and then pull that back to an individual farm. So I want to introduce those topics and hopefully we can get good dialogue going on after the meeting today about ways that we can put that into an annualized basis. So to do that, I started off with just a, a hypothetical farm. I'm relying heavily upon the way that we work in our particular farm in Pettis County, corn soybean rotation and take a look at both the annual impacts as well as some of the things we might see on a longer term basis. So to start off with, uh, utilizing some information from the University of Missouri in terms of 2014, um, looking at what projected costs are going to be on the input side for nutrients, fuel, and such, as well as yield projections and price projections for the future. So this just gives you an idea, you see at the right hand side of the screen, um, what the type of analysis that I did, I tweaked it here and there um, for some assumptions, probably more applicable to our particular farming operation. And when you take a look at what that means, essentially you've got your soybean budget looking for year two, your corn budget for year one, and realistically above all costs, variable, fixed, machinery depreciation, everything looped together, a little over $100, $110 over that two year time frame in terms of net profits. So don't get caught up in the numbers, it's just a baseline to be able to start with. Um, 
cover crops for this particular analysis from an economic perspective, um, I've always been counseled and I, th I think it's accurate that you select cover crops based upon your own particular situation. So don't get caught up in the three cover crops that I'm displaying here for your particular farm or in your case, the farmers you may be helping, it may be entirely different. Um, I was wanting to look at two blends. Uh, first of all, a ryegrass um, crimson clover blend and then also a tillage radish and crimson clover blend. Um, I did that primarily because of the fact that we have had some issues with compaction. We have some clay plant soils. I'm also wanting to be able to scavenge some of those nutrients and that's where the radish and the, crim and the um, ryegrass is going to come in. Um, from a lot of work that I've seen and talking with other producers, primarily in Indiana and Illinois, crimson makes a very nice companion crop and also you have that added benefit of looking at some potential bumps in terms of nitrogen on the nutrient side. So that was the reason and rationale for those particular selections. So what's this mean on an annual basis, kind of beyond the, the anticipated, which is the fact that you have an application cost, you've also got seed costs. What can we anticipate on an annual basis that might find us in terms of reduced inputs or on the benefit side? So first level, um, nitrogen fixation coming from the clover itself. You know, we've, we've seen in many trials and, and research plots that you can look at anywhere between 70 to 150 pounds of nitrogen um, but by mid-May. This is information though coming from the south. What we're looking at though in this particular scenario, and I think many of you would attest, is first of all it's a blend. Second thing is, is that we're looking at this before corn. So we're going to try to terminate early in April. We want to plant by mid to late April in terms of the corn itself. So for the analysis, I'm assuming around 30 pounds of contribution from the clover. Could that be high? Yes. Um, probably not necessarily low. But again, don't get caught up in the numbers, just get caught up in the fact that there is an added benefit there. Second thing, from a nutrient cycling standpoint, and this is why, you know, I still have faith in going to conferences. Sometimes they're long, but I always get nuggets of information and, and things that I wish I would have done ahead of time. I was interested this morning whenever Rich was talking about um, some of the work that they had done with Green Seeker in terms of looking at side dressing with various cover crops and um, showed a significant reduction in terms of the side dress necessary with crimson clover versus some of the other cover crops. Um, in this particular case, what I was wanting to do with this hypothetical rotation is to take a look at ryegrass as the ability to be able to scavenge and then release at the time that I need it the most in terms of corn production. Um, I'm a believer in side dressing. We've done it for several years. Most recently, we've actually switched over to a system where we are actually broadcasting urea. We're commercially hiring it um, just because of the fact that I work as well. And so being able to get in and side dress in a timely manner sometimes was difficult. And so we're broadcasting urea. We're hiring it done by our local input supplier. And in that particular case, last year, for example, the average across all of our corn um, that was added was around 42 pounds of N. Um, that's you know, highs and lows coming in in different places, but it averaged around 42 pounds. So the hope was is that, and for this particular analysis, is, is it possible that with ryegrass that we could actually see from a cycling standpoint that that nitrogen becomes available at the point in time that that corn needs it and could we avoid a side dress? Another point to consider, and I didn't include this in the analysis, but I'm always curious as to the ability or what impact nutrients may have um, from a soybean perspective. So first of all, it's not part of the analysis, but it is something to think about. Uh, you know, if we're talking about 40, 45, maybe even 50 bushel beans, maybe it's not a big deal that there's not an extra nitrogen requirement. However, if we start thinking about pushing the envelope on some of our better yielding soils, and if we want to talk about 60, 65, 70 bushel beans, just when you start thinking about the actual nutrient requirement of soybeans, there is some interesting research coming out. Most of it that I've viewed has been from South Dakota, Nebraska. I'm sure there's other work that's gone on about being able to put on fuller applications of nitrogen in that R3 stage. So again, from a cycling standpoint, could there be any benefit either from the crimson clover, coming from the cycling with the radish in terms of into the future? I, this part I don't know, which is why it's not part of the analysis, but just something to think about. Um, other considerations in terms of um, weed control itself, uh, we normally primarily use glyphosate as a burn down. So there's not necessarily any additional cost in terms of termination for the cover crops. I did add a little bit more because in my experience, clover is a little bit difficult to, to deal with. So in, in addition to glyphosate, I added in some 2,4-D. Um, before the actual soybean um, crop, in terms of being able to burn down, radish, of course, is going to winter kill. And then with their crimson clover, my experience has been is that uh, a tank mix of uh, glyphosate and Invive, that the invites, Invive is hot enough to be able to smoke most clovers. 
Granted, I have not done it with crimson clover, but other clovers I've been able to control. So um, in addition, uh, we have um, historically utilized uh, deep ripping or an inline ripper on our farm, hoping to do that once every two to three years. Mother Nature sometimes plays havoc with that on our particular farm in terms of getting that work done. So in this particular case, that's one pass that I think we can eliminate. And I know that some of you who are, um, have been utilizing no-till and cover crops for a number of years, that the thought process of having a ripper is probably difficult for you to understand, but we have been able to see the yield benefit on, on our particular farm. So when you put all that together and you take a look at what those seed costs may be of a blend, and I've compensated for the fact that this will be an aerial application, the quote last year was $12 an acre from a local applicator aerially, and looking at um, higher seeding rates in terms of broadcast. And again, I know that there are those that um, have their preferences and biases in terms of the best way to be able to plant cover crops. On our particular situation, this is what would work best just because from a timing standpoint. So when we look at all that over the two year time period, we're still looking uh, from an input standpoint of an extra $35 an acre. So uh, you know, for better or for worse, as a producer, this is one of the first things we see is the impact on our cash flow. Now keep in mind, I haven't touched yield in any of this. This is purely in terms of dollars in and out with no um, addition of looking at yield. The other thing I would add is, is that in the past when we've worked with cover crops, um, we worked with cereal rye, um, actually planting cereal rye and being able to use that as a way to eliminate a burn down, um, which has worked effectively uh, in the past. And um, we've also worked with clovers. In the case of both, we have grazed because we're, we have a commercial cow-calf operation as well. When I've done the economics in our particular farm and every year on an annualized basis, it actually has been a positive benefit when I account for the forage that we've been able to take advantage of. But in this particular case, I, I didn't account for it. So realistically, we get to the longer term and what those other yield factors are. And this is where I think it'll be interesting. So for Pat and Ryan and all of you that work on the economic side of the equation, how can we take all this information and then boil it down into impacts that a producer wants to be able to understand on an annualized basis? Can we do that? So the first thing I wanted to address was basically impacts of increased organic matter. And um, I'm, I can't do a better job than what's been done already today talking about those positive benefits. What I can say is that when we think about what this means in terms of water holding capacity, um, someone asked me at one point in time, you know, do I believe the uh, SARE results from last year about the increase in terms of yield? And by all considerations, I do. Um, our particular farm, I mentioned that I farm with my father. We have what I consider to be a traditional management relationship where we sit down every year, we talk about varieties, we talk about what we want to do. I have my thoughts, he has his thoughts, and in the end, we do whatever he wants. <laughs> So for years, I had been trying to be able to get to, let's, let's pump up the nitrogen, let's pump up the seeding rate on our corn. And he kept, you know, kind of overruling me from a management standpoint. And 2004 is branded in my head. Because, um, so we're Pettis County, south of I-70. Um, 2004, we had a great year, cool temperatures. We had more than adequate rainfall. We raised 180 plus bushel corn on 130 units of nitrogen. And he's like, that's what I've been trying to tell you. You just won't listen. We are a water-limited soil. What would I give for an extra inch and a half, inch, inch and a half of water holding capacity? That's why I believe these, this data wholeheartedly. From a second standpoint, um, of course, it's well documented the fact that increasing organic matter um, also has an impact in terms of available nutrients. Um, this just gives you an idea, again, looking at a way to be able to get this back to an annualized basis. What does it mean? Um, if you had a 2% increase in terms of organic matter, being able to mineralize a portion of that on an annual basis, let's just say if you're going 1% increase in organic matter, a little over $10 an acre, just in terms of the benefit in terms of nitrogen or in terms of nutrients. Disease suppression, I thought there was um, a couple of individuals earlier today that made some great points in terms of reduction of SCN. Um, you think about it, we, we've been very lucky in our particular farm in terms of not having a lot of disease issues. A couple of years ago, we had some pretty bad incidences of SDS. Besides looking at varieties that are not as susceptible, what's the way you get rid of it? Or what's the way you decrease the, the problems? You, you rotate it out, right? So adding a cover crop in is essentially, even though you're not lengthening your time period, it's a way to be able to help rotate out and to be able to suppress diseases. What's this worth for a farmer that's having, I mean, I can tell you what the impact was on our particular farm on that particular field where we had a bad case of SDS. It's, it's huge. So being able to get this information back on an annualized basis is what we need to do. Again, just to introduce some other topics, uh, which have been already talked about today, I'm, I'm 
already talked to Newell Kitchen about wanting to be able to get some of the sediment loss data from their particular work. Um, obviously, there's an impact in terms of yield reduction with soil erosion. Um, the, the biggest thing I can say that for those of us that are pushing out dollars every year in terms of cash flow, if we're going to pay for the nutrients, there's absolutely no reason why we want to see those moving off of our farm. And obviously more. I mentioned grazing earlier. It is an impact on our farm because we're diversified. The rotational benefits I've already mentioned, resistance to soil compaction, the alleviation of soil compaction. Uh, these are all things that we as economists need to get back to a per dollar or per acre benefit to the producers. So again, um, don't worry about the numbers. Think about the trends. If all of that impact of being able to incorporate cover crops into our farm just had a 5% change in yield, it, it's obvious the financial incentive. It goes right back to my plumber's concept of, look, look what this means. How can we not look at cover crops when you think about the yield change potential? So I've, I've only got two minutes left. I wanted to at least introduce two or three other things that maybe are what you haven't considered as ways that, that we on the economic side as social scientists that we need to try to figure out what type of data we need to be able to prove or disprove the following. First, um, I interact with a lot of folks up in Iowa um, working with soybean farmers there in particular. And Joe Parcell, you know, always tells me all about Iowa and how great it is to, to farm up there. And so I started looking into all the land sales that have been going on and essentially in Iowa they, they bring it back down to a land rating. And some of this fall about $125 per point on their CSR1 or CSR2 scale. So to me it's always interesting is that we start thinking about organic matter. Intuitively we do it the same way with rent, right? We think about yield potential. But is it the yield potential of the soil or is it the yield potential of the person that's been farming it in terms of what we think that that land is worth? So to me it's always interesting as if we get to that point where rent is actually attributable and we can correlate that back to yield potential and organic matter. Second, water quality. And this has been touched on multiple times. Um, what I felt was interesting, and especially the field that I work in as well, not just on crop issues but also on biofuels issues, is the impacts of regulatory actions. And I heard this quote coming out of Iowa, voluntary but not optional as it relates to water quality. So, you know, it is our responsibility as producers to be able to do the best job that we can in terms of stewardship. But we also just can look at it from a dollars and cents standpoint. Again, any nutrient that we pay for, we definitely want to see it stay on our farm. And last thing, um, again, coming back to the use of cover crops and risk mitigation. Uh, obviously, crop insurance, it's a major topic with the Farm Bill. The ability to be able to mitigate risk through the use of cover crops in terms of very dry years or very wet years, I think that that is something where we need to try to get that data set around this particular issue because it's very possible that we can show that it does help mitigate risk. And if we could translate that into crop insurance premiums, um, that would, from my perspective, uh, be a step forward. So with that, um, can we afford cover crops? I tend to look at it the other way, at least for our farm, is can we afford to not use cover crops? And it's the reason why my father and I are, are very interested in continuing our path forward. Thank you. Time for one or two quick questions. Paul Carey coming forward. Any questions? Uh, the, the question was whether or not we'd ever cut our cover crop for haylage. And so in one year, we put it up into uh, bags, baleage. And so we uh, harvested it at uh, high moisture. Um, we had it tested, and I would have to say that, again, Mother Nature and my travel schedule playing havoc, we did not get it at the point in time that we wanted to cut it. So the, um, the actual nutrient quality was okay, but it wouldn't be what I would consider to be superior. But again, it was, it was a management issue on our part. Thank you.